Hey guys, hey YouTube, you know who it is, I figured you got tired of my uh, usual intro, so I whipped up a little something. Alright, today in FL Studio, I'm going to show you how to rock your arpeggiator, how to really create some, uh, some realistic and convincing uh, sounds to make it sort of seem almost as if uh, it was being played by a live person. Uh, you can use this for ambience, or you can use this whenever you desire a bit of chaos, or um, well, you don't have to have it chaos uh, because the arpeggiator comes in many, many flavors. Um, let's take a look. I'm going to create an FL keys, and I'm going to create uh, two more. Actually, we're going to work with three. Um, you don't have to use three, but I recommend at least two. Uh, this is our system here. This is what we're going to do. We're going to have one of these keys be our arpeggio, and we're going to have these two be simply like a, a rhythm, the rhythm section. So uh, what we're going to do is take our last keys, I'm going to drop the pitch down by 12 notes so that it produces sort of a semi chord whenever I do that. And I'm going to set all three of these to be children in my layer. Okay. Um, if you're not familiar with layers, what that means is that whenever this plays, whenever my layer plays, which I'll play right now. triggers all three of its children. So they'll play the same note. Got it? Great. All right, now onto the arpeggio. On the functions tab of most of the um, plugins, if they're VSTI compatible, you'll see that um, it has an arpeggiator group down here as the second box. Okay. Um, the top row here will determine the playing direction, whether it plays up, um, should sound like this. Whether it plays down. So this is uh, very similar to um, the new, what is it, the RPG-8, I think, in Reason 4. But rather than taking a... Uh, Actually, it will automatically detect your scale if you want to play it that way. Um, but what we can do here, you can't see this unfortunately because the menu is transparent and my encoder doesn't pick up transparency, but there's about um, 48 different um, settings I can choose from. They're all labeled according to the common chords. Um, I can choose something like a minor ninth, a minor additive ninth, a C or a six sustained four, the Arabic scale, the Locrian mode, Lydian mode, and so on and so on. It's really extensive here, and um, it can be overwhelming if you're not uh, well versed in music theory. I'm going to leave this as a major chord, um, so what we're going to get is a little bit of an upbeat, happy arpeggio piece. And uh, to, to familiarize yourself with these knobs, um, the timing is probably the most important. It's 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 counted in steps, and this is one step. Uh, if we put it up at two steps, it'll play a lot slower. And as we crank it down, it will become almost impossibly fast. Now you can do you can do that um, to add some craziness to a synth piece because it'll always play it in a major chord or a major arpeggio. You can make a, you make some pretty wild sounds um, with one note or one key press. Uh, the gate is just going to determine the staccato nature of the following keys. Not much to that. And down below we have some timing settings. These are kind of important as well. This will determine um, whether the arpeggio will continue throughout the entire duration of the note or whether it will stop at a certain point. So this should cut it off at just after one step. And it does. And the offset will give you a little bit of time control as to when, um, when each key hits. You can give it a bit of swing in that way. Okay, so let's move right along. Um, keep in mind every function that we've just talked about can be automated. Oh, also the range here, although I'll have to give it a faster a faster um, setting in order for you to hear it. This determines how many octaves 
the arpeggio will play. And again, all of these can be automated. Okay, now to add a bit of swing to this to make it sound like a normal, like something a human being would play, what we're going to do is, is create an LFO using the peak controller. And what I'm going to do is set the volume for a pretty low setting and put the bass level at about 57%. Okay, and my volume is only at about 7%. 7 so that produces a very, a very um, slight variation here. It's not a very strong LFO. <coughs> but what we're going to do is link that to our timing. And we get a little bit of jitter right there. That's what we want. So now we have a little bit of swing, a little bit of humanization, very simply, and we can adjust that using the peak controller variables whenever we want to. I might even turn this LFO down just a little bit. Um, all of those settings are entirely up to you. So um, what we have right now is a fairly simple way to um, sort of humanize an arpeggi arpeggiator. And we, we've got it playing with both hands, if you want to think of it that way. It's got uh, two regular keys and one, the right hand playing the arpeggio. It's a bit higher than the rest. So um, what we're going to do right now is structure a few patterns here, which are going to take advantage of that. Okay. Um, you know what? I have to put this recorder on pause. Okay. So uh, what you do at this point, after you've got this uh, basic arpeggio set up, create a couple of patterns that are just one block long. Notice I've color coded these just to make them uh, sort of easy. They fit together. And um, each one simply has a different um, solitary piece of automation that deals with uh, something. For example, um, this one, which is called two notes, um, affects only the arpeggio gate, which is how many, how many uh, bars it'll play. The complementary pattern to this is called full arp, which restores it to its full length. If we look at some of the other patterns, like uh, range one, this is the arpeggio range for one octave, and the one right below it, or the one, I'm sorry, this is two range, that's set for two octaves, and the one below it is set for um, one octave. Sorry. And uh, it carries along uh, through this, these are different arpeggio types. And the reason you break it up this way is so that when you play a pattern like this, what I can do is actually just sort of structure, um, however I choose, a different arpeggio for each bar of the song. Unfortunately, it's playing too fast for it to, for you to hear the down part. But if I uh, hit a fast button down here, we can speed it up. So it gives you a lot of control over how your arpeggio is going to sound. So um, we can, for example, give it a high and then a low portion. So this is just a very simple way to do it. Um, using this method, the way that I've uh, structured this, we can even completely uh, change our um, initial pattern. And all of these um, attributes of the arpeggiator should still apply. Now this fast one is kind of obnoxious. It's not a very good example, but it just demonstrates uh, how you can use um, smaller, complementary, non-musical patterns. Right? These are just data patterns. All they contain is automation data. And you can use these to sort of customize and shape your arpeggio to fit your needs. Um, I think that's about it. This is all I've got. This sounds excellent if you use it on one of the Slayer plugins. I, I for some reason just the guitar um, works. It, it lends itself very well toward toward messy arpeggios. And um, this is just a brief tutorial on some of the options that the arpeggiator gives you and how to maximize it, use it to its fullest. I hope this is.